We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Super embarrassed. I didn't even know they were filming while I was dancing in my office. That's awkward. Uh, they captured all that. Anyway, just kidding. Hey, really glad you're here. If we haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I'd love to meet you after service out in the lobby or parking lot or somewhere. My name's Matt. I serve here at ACC as a lead pastor. And uh, today we're starting a brand new series. So it's a really great week to be here with us as we're going through this thing called Movers and Shakers. Before I tell you what Movers and Shakers is about, I want to whet your appetite a little bit for what's coming after this series. Uh, we're going to wrap up the year. We're going to do a series called Origins, where we're talking about the beginning of all things. We're going to go through the book uh, of Genesis together. And then we're going to wrap up the year, the end part of the year. We're going to go through the book of James together, which is going to be a really cool thing. But for right now, we're starting a brand new series for five weeks called Movers and Shakers. And you might be thinking, what is a mover and a shaker? Have you ever been called a mover and a shaker before? Or maybe you've heard someone else called a mover and a shaker? I remember one time, in, uh, right after I graduated college, I, I graduated from Liberty University, and uh, I was about 21 years old, and I got a full-time job in our admissions department. And so I was in the admissions department at Liberty, and at one point, uh, Jerry Falwell Sr., the one who founded the university, he was still alive at the time, he was coming through, and he was talking about some things that were going on, some initiatives, and I was just happened to be in the room, and I threw up some ideas out there, and for whatever reason, it kind of stuck that I had a bunch of ideas. So about a week later, uh, I got a phone call saying, Jerry Falwell would like you to go to his office. I'm like, all right. So I go to his office, and in there, it's him, and like all the executives of the university are kind of sitting in there in a meeting, and he's like, oh, and this is Matt. He's my mover and my shaker. I'm like, I didn't even know you knew my name. And yet I, he said, Matt, I just want you to listen. We're going to be talking about some things. If you have any ideas, raise your hand, right? And just throw them out there. So here's, here's what a mover and a shaker is. A mover and a shaker is someone who's willing to do whatever it takes to, to get past the next hurdle, to, to, to launch the next product, to whatever it is, right? To close the deal. That mover and the shaker in your workplace is that person. It doesn't matter if, if there's some sort of hurdle and you want to get past that hurdle, you know who in your office is the mover and the shaker. They can get things done, right? Well, here in the church, we don't have a product we're trying to sell, Right? The, the product here, if you, if you will, what we're trying to get done here is each of us is trying to become more like Jesus. That's the goal. And, and even better than that, we're trying to help the people around us also become more like Jesus. That's what we do around here. We all are on this process of becoming more Christ-like and helping the people around us become more Christ-like. So how cool would it be if we we're a church of movers and shakers when it comes to that goal? Like we're, doing, we're willing to do whatever it takes. I want to become more like Jesus. I want to be a mover. I want to shake things up. I want to make some changes to my life so that I can become more like Christ. And so if you want to be a mover, if you want to be a mover and a shaker, I suggest there's five things we're going to talk about over the next five weeks that you need to work into your life. You need to, to do these things, and the people around you that you care about, your family, you want to instill these things into them so they too can be a mover and a shaker. And those five things, we call them our catalysts, our worship regularly, serve or connect relationally, grow personally, uh, serve sacrificially, and give generously. And those are the five things we're going to talk about over the next five weeks. Those are the things you got to do to be a mover and a shaker. Today, we're going to talk about the first one, which is worship regularly. Let me, let me make it real clear. If you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith, you're going to have to make a commitment to worship God regularly. And I'm not just talking about worshiping like alone. We're, we're talking about something really specific here. And this is called corporate worship. 
This is where you gather together with other people, what we're doing right now in this room, to worship God together. This has got to be part of the recipe of your life if you want to be a mover and a shaker. So let's, let's ask the first question, the obvious question is, what is worship? When we say to worship regularly, and especially corporate worship, what we're doing now, what does that mean? For most of us, if we're being honest, when somebody says the word worship, the first thing that comes to your mind is what we just finished doing, right? It's a worship team, and they get up and play some instruments, and they sing some songs, and we raise our hands, and we clap our hands, and, and, and that, we're like, oh, okay, now that the worship is over, the pastor's going to get up now and teach. But the truth is, the, the worship isn't over, right? If you understand what worship is, it's really a word. It comes from the, the, the concept of worth-ship. Uh, how much worth do you ascribe to something at that the things that you, you ascribe the most value to, that you, you give the most worth to in your life, those are the things you worship. And you worship God in many different ways. You worship other things, unfortunately, in many different ways. If you look at, let me read a quote to you. It's from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He said, a person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret, in the dark recesses of our hearts, but it will come out. That which dominates our imaginations and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it is us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Now, here's an interesting thing about Ralph Waldo Emerson. He was a, a kind of a spiritual person, but he wasn't a follower of Jesus. And even he was able to realize that it doesn't matter if you uh, ascribe to Christianity or you have another faith system. And by the way, atheism is another faith system, right? In fact, I think atheists have more faith than I do, all right? And so it doesn't matter what faith system that you have, everyone in this room, whatever faith system you are part of, we all worship something. And for many of us, unfortunately, it's, it's a lot of different things that we ascribe a higher value to than other things in our life. We, we, we value those things. And the, to be honest, there's only one thing. It's not a thing. It's, it's a person. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons in one. God is the only thing worthy of our worship. In fact, what should be is that we put so much value in God that even the things that we value pretty heavily here on earth, like I value my marriage. It, I should value God so much that in comparison to the way I value my marriage and value my children and value my fill in the blank, that just doesn't even compare because the only thing's worthy of my worship is God. And so that's what worship is. So worship isn't just people on stage singing songs. That's incredibly powerful way to worship. When you read about worship in Scripture, you're going to hear about instruments. You're going to hear about clapping. You're going to hear about shouting. You're going to hear about bowing. You're going to hear about postures. You're going to hear, uh, that's all part of worship. But the truth is that when we get in here, we worship through singing. We also worship through praying. We worship through remembering. When we take communion together, we're, we're ascribing worth to God by remembering what he did for us on the cross in communion. We are also worshiping God right now as we open up his word together. I'm going to read some passages of scripture with you. And as we value the word of God together, we're saying, God, you're, you're worth it. You are worth this time of my Sunday to open up your word with other brothers and sisters in Christ to learn more about you. You're worth it. This is worship. So then the question is, but well, can't I worship on my own at home? Why, why do I got to come here? I've heard of waterproof Bibles. Have you, do you know there's a waterproof Bible that you can take in the shower? You can go in the shower and you can sing. You can clap your hands and you can read the Bible and you can pray. You're like, why can't I just do that there? Why do I need to come together with all these people? And there's actually something different about what happens in corporate worship than what happens in private worship. Now, private worship is awesome. Do that. Worship God with all of your heart, all of your life. But there's something, if you want to be a mover and a shaker, you have to value this corporate gathering of worship. There's something special that happens. Let me read a verse in Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. It says, let us, 
That's the church, right? Let us think of ways that we can motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And then it says this, and let us not neglect our meeting together. And then it goes on to say, as, as some people do. There are some people out there who are neglecting this experience right here, or they don't prioritize this in their life. They're not going to be movers and shakers. Scripture says that we have to gather together, not neglect this gathering. It says not neglect, and even goes on to say, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. In other words, it is more important for us to be in the house of God with other believers today than it was yesterday. Because today is closer to the return of Christ than yesterday was. Tomorrow, it's going to be more important for you to gather with other believers for corporate worship than it is today. So every Sunday, it becomes more and more valuable to gather together in corporate worship here in this space. Isn't that amazing? You see, the Bible wants us and tells us very clearly not to neglect this meeting. And here's why there's something different about corporate worship. There's a word that you've probably heard me say multiple times if you've been part of this church for just like a two weeks, right? It's the word koinonia. It's one of my favorite Greek words. And koinonia, we actually find in the book of Acts. It's where the church started, right? And this word koinonia, it's another word. It's basically the word like in common. And when it goes through scripture and it says that the early church got together and they had everything in common, They were willing to see each other as part of the same body of Christ, the same family of believers, that they literally said, listen, anything I have is yours. What's yours is mine. Everything we've got, we have in common. Well, one of the coolest versions of koinonia we see in Scripture is that when believers gather together in corporate worship, you know one of the things, the most powerful things we have in common? If you're in this room and you have given your life to Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you. And I have the Holy Spirit inside of me. We have the Holy Spirit in common. And when Scripture says where two or more are gathered, I am in the midst of them. I know that verse is in the context of church discipline, but let let me make sure you understand what's happening here. It's not like God's not there when you're by yourself in the shower. God's everywhere. He's omnipresent. But what happens when you gather together with other believers in corporate worship The Holy Spirit that you have and that I have in common, it actually, it's like we're tethering together our connection to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is in the midst of us. How cool is that? There's certain things that happen in corporate worship that just aren't going to happen when you're by yourself. And I want to share some of those things with you. It's kind of like, listen, we know that the church is a body and we know this body that you're designed to feed yourself. You should go home on Monday and uh, tomorrow and spend time in God's Word on your own. On Tuesday, you should spend time in this book. You should be feeding yourself. The body is meant to feed itself. But there are certain supplements, right? When you're maybe trying to grow a certain muscle or you're, you're sick and you're deficient on something, a doctor might assign, tell you, hey, take this supplement. It's when corporate worship is ultimately, it's a body that's feeding itself, but there's something necessary about this experience. It's, a, it's an incredibly powerful supplement if you want to be a mover and a shaker. You've got to do it. If you want to be a mover and a shaker in your faith, you're going to commit to participating in corporate worship regularly. Let me call out a particular group of people here for just a second. Uh, we're unapologetically a complementarian church. Now, you might not know what that means, but let me just... Let me tell you, we believe that God's word says that men are specifically charged with being the leaders of their households. And so men, I want to challenge you for just a moment. If you're thinking, well, all right, I'm supposed to lead my, in my home. I'm supposed to, to, to lead and make sure that my home, and that we're movers and shakers, that we're becoming more like Christ. What am I supposed to do? Well, here's one of the easiest things you can do is to say, in my house... We go to church. It's not a decision we make on Saturday night. It's not a decision we make on Sunday morning. We don't check the weather app. We don't look at this. We're just like, no. We, in my house growing up, that's the way it was. I would hear my dad, my dad had this phrase. It was up and at him. Up and at him. Why? Because we already knew we were going to church. It wasn't a decision. 
When I saw someone on Thursday, if that would go to our church, I would be able to say without even wondering, hey, see you Sunday, because that's where we're going to be. And so I want to challenge you to, to make sure that a corporate worship experience is part of your growth strategy. Here, here's three things. If, if you're taking notes this morning, I want to give you our three fill in the blanks. And it's from, it's all going to come from a passage in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you've got a Bible with you this morning, open up to Isaiah chapter 6. We're going to read through this, this vision that, that Isaiah had. And we're going to see this really powerful corporate worship experience. But let me give you your first fill in the blank. You ready? Worshiping regularly expands our perspective on the greatness of God. So again, you're asking, Matt, why, why should I worship with other believers? Well, here's why. One of the benefits we're going to see is that it's going to open up your mind. It's going to expand your perspective on how good and big and awesome God is in a way that's not going to happen if you're by yourself. By the way, I was typing up these notes this week, and I wasn't sure if I should have two P's or one P in worshiping. And so I, I, I asked Google, and Google said either is appropriate. So I think this is the UK way. So for the rest of the, the lesson or teaching today, I'm just going to be British if that's okay, okay? All right, so Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Just kidding. All right. Just kidding. All right. Here's what it says. It says, it was in the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. So this is Isaiah, and he has this vision. It says that the Lord, he was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. These are the uh, seraphim, by the way, these, these huge angels, okay? They don't look like the angels that you, you probably have like on your, your book stand somewhere, right? So it says, each of them had six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And they were calling out to each other. So you hear the corporate worship. There's a bunch of seraphim and Isaiah's here watching all this go down. And they're all singing, holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. How holy is our God? Even the angels got to say it three times to try to get it clear. Holy, holy, holy. And then it says this, their voices shook the temple to its foundations and the entire building was filled with smoke. I'll tell you, I've been to some nights of worship here in this place. I've been to some really powerful moments of worshiping God together with other believers I don't think we've ever shook this place to its foundation. I don't know if we've ever worshipped so powerfully that, that dust from the rafters made this place feel like it was like, like uh, that's a really powerful corporate worship experience. The angels are all singing together. They're flying around. They're making a big, you know, ruckus. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And so Isaiah sees this. And what it does is it expands his perspective on the greatness of God. You know, when it says the train of his robe filled the temple, I'll give you a couple ideas to think about. You know, Queen Elizabeth had a, uh, an 18-foot train on, when she would wear a certain robe. It was 18 feet long. That's pretty long. You know, back in the day when, an, when a, a king would defeat another king or a, a queen would defeat another queen, or whatever, right? When you would, your kingdom would take over another kingdom, you would take the train off of that king's robe and you would sew it on to the end of yours. And so the longer your train, it was basically a sign of victory, of, of the size of your kingdom. Well, if God's train, Isaiah is looking in this, this worship experience and, and as this corporate worship is happening, as these seraphim are flying around, he sees that God's train fills the temple. It's not an 18-foot train. It's not a 20-foot train. It's not, I mean, it, it fills it. The whole thing is full of the train of God's robe. That's how wonderfully powerful and great and good and victorious he is. And what happens in these corporate worship experiences is, is your eyes are going to be open to how good God is. It's so awesome. 
In fact, think about why this is important. You ready for this? The bigger your God, the smaller your problem. The more that you see the greatness of God, the more that you expand your mind to how good and powerful and mighty God is, it doesn't matter what's going on in your life because those little things now become little things. They become smaller and smaller and smaller as God becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. So you get together with other believers in corporate worship and what happens is God, he expands your your vision for how great and awesome he is and all the problems in your life just become really small. That's a really cool and powerful thing to see happen. Here's the second thing. Worshiping regularly also reminds us of our desperate need for God. You know, when you see how awesome something else is, it's really easy to walk up to it and realize how small and insignificant you are. Right? Again, you walk up to an ocean, it becomes really clear that you're kind of just a speck of dust on, on a map somewhere, right? The thing's huge. And when you understand the greatness of God, which is number one, it's going to lead to number two, which is that reminding us of our desperate need for him. So Isaiah says in, in verse five, it says, then I said, it's all over. <laughs> just a glimpse of God, all right? Just a glimpse of God's goodness. And he sees God in that moment of corporate worship. And he says, it's all over, I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. God is so great in comparison to his brokenness in this moment that he sees his desperate need. He says, woe is me. In, in the NLT, it says, I, it's all over. I am doomed, okay? In your NIV or KJV, it probably says, woe is me. And it comes from the Hebrew... Oile. Or in the Yiddish version of that, you've probably heard oive. When you've heard someone who maybe isn't from a Jewish background say oive, what they're really saying in that moment is, woe is me. They realize in that moment how, how desperate they are in need of something. Oive. Here's the cool thing about Isaiah's experience in this worship setting. In Isaiah chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, leading up to this experience, you know, there are eight times where Isaiah says, woe is them. Oi, them. Oi, those people. Look at all those sinners out there, God. They're all over the place. This world is surrounded. I'm surrounded by sinners. Eight times he says, oi, them. And then he has this corporate worship experience. He sees how big God is, and it changes his mind up totally. And now he's like, oi, me. I'm a sinner. I have unclean lips. I don't deserve to be in the presence of God. You see, in this experience, it goes first from a, an understanding of God's goodness to now an understanding of our desperate need for him. Switching from seeing others sin to seeing your own. You know, sometimes we look at humility. Uh, what's the definition of humility? And some people think, well, it's lowering yourself so that others can be made great. I want you to understand that True humility is actually standing at full height, full attention, and recognizing in that moment how small you are compared to how great something else is. Humility doesn't mean I got to to pretend and just wallow in in, in the fact that I'm a broken sinner. In fact, think about this, this thought for just a moment. You ready? God doesn't want us to sit in our sin. He wants us to stand in his grace. He doesn't, the goal of you recognizing that you're desperately in need of him isn't to get you to crawl up into a little ball and thinking, all right, God, the one way I can show you how desperately I need you is to, to, to humble myself into the small little nothing and just, no, God wants you not to sit like that. He wants you to recognize your sin so that you can stand confidently in his grace. Because listen, when you stand at full attention, you still recognize how big and good God is. You don't need to curl up. You recognize you can stand in his grace because he is good and you're desperately in need of him. 
In fact, you want to get as close to him as possible. Jumping up and down. God, I need you. I need you. Here's the third fill in the blank for you this morning. Worshiping regularly, what it does next is it clarifies our purpose as servants of God. What it does is it's going to give you some clarity in your own life about why you're here. Why did God put you in this place? Why did God put you in your workplace? Why did God put you in in your home? What is the whole purpose of your life about? God's brought you here for a reason. And when you gather together with other believers, he's going to use them and use this experience. And the Holy Spirit's drawing it out out of you and in the midst of you. It's going to, all of that's going to be part of this process of you understanding the purpose that God has given to you as a servant of him. Here's what happens to Isaiah in verse 8. If we keep reading his story. And by the way, before we even get to, to Isaiah 8, or 6 verse 8, Isaiah says, woe is me. And the first thing that happens is the angels come and, and grab a coal out of the altar. And they bring it and touch it to Isaiah's lips. And he's, he's cleansed. Notice what happens there. The moment you recognize your sin, it, that recognition is going to draw your attention to your desperate need for the cross. And you're going to say, God, I, I desperately need you. And then it always, worship always points you to the cross. It always points you to the cross. And so when we talk about clarifying our purpose as servants of God, here's what it says in, in verse 8. Then Isaiah said, he, he, then I heard the Lord asking, Let me just pause right there for just a moment. One of my favorite things that happens in corporate worship, that happens when we gather together with other believers, is we have a very intentional time together where we have a worship team that is designed to help prepare our hearts and our minds to to remember what God's done for us on the cross through communion. And then we have an opportunity to to worship God through our giving. And then we open up God's word for teaching. All of this is a very strategic experience where we're able to then be in a posture of being ready to listen. Out there, we have all sorts of distractions. There's all sorts of things crying for our attention. There's bills and work and jobs and bosses and kids and all that. We can come in here and say, God, I just want to tune my ears so that when you have something to say, I'm able to hear you. And Isaiah has experienced this corporate worship. He's sitting there and now he says right there, right? Then I heard the Lord asking. I would hope that your goal walking into here as we worship together on a Sunday morning is to always walk out more like Jesus. And in order to do that, you have to be intentional about, God, my ears are listening. What do you want to say to me? And Isaiah is saying, God, what do you want to say to me? And he's listening. And then God says, whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will go for us? And I think of this idea of who are you listening to? You know, we're not, we shouldn't be listening to social media. We shouldn't be listening to Hollywood. We shouldn't be listening to Washington, D.C., right? Our salvation doesn't fly on Air Force One. Our salvation doesn't come out of a, a courtroom with eight justices. Our salvation comes from the cross. It comes from Jesus. And so who are you listening to? And Isaiah is saying, listen, when I gather together with other believers in corporate worship, I'm tuning my ear to the only voice that matters. And in this case, the Lord says, who am I going to send as a messenger to my people? You want to know what truth is? I wrote this down. Truth is established by the one who sits on the throne. There's only one form of truth. There's only one person who is truth, and it's God. It says in, in Romans 12, I, I love how uh, this was rewritten in a paraphrased version of Scripture called the message In Romans 12, 2, it says, Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God, and then you will be changed from the inside out. But listen to this. It says, Readily recognize what He wants from you, and then quickly respond to it. Do you see this posture of listening? We walk into this room hopefully with a posture of being ready to listen. And we go and we say, God, I want to be readily 
available to recognize what it is you're calling me into? What is your purpose for me being here this morning? What is it that you want me to do this week? What is it, how, how should I make this decision in a way that honors you? I'm listening. And then it says that God, you know, we see him speak. He answers questions and says, then quickly respond. We have the ability to, to recognize our purpose as servants of God. So what does he want from you? What is your purpose? Think about this for a moment. In, in corporate worship, I, I wrote down, worship is about us serving his purposes, God's purposes, not getting God to serve ours. When we worship God, it is about us serving his purposes. God, what is it that you want me to do? Because I'm here to worship you, not to get you to make me feel good, not to, to have this experience of fellowship. I'm not here about me. I'm here to serve you. And that's what Isaiah does in verse 8, the second part of verse 8. He answers the question. He says, here I am. Send me. He had tuned his ears to hear God speak, and God said, who am I going to send? And Isaiah said, God, I want to be in the middle of the purpose you have for my life. Send me. Let me be the one who goes. You see, when you worship God regularly with other believers, you'll be able to see your purpose with clarity and be encouraged by others and ultimately by the Holy Spirit to accomplish your purpose boldly. I love how God used other people in my life to call me into my purpose. I was a business owner for 10 years, and I believe that in that season of my life, I was fulfilling the purpose God had for my life. But there was a clear, uh, about a year period where there was just confusion and a little bit of chaos in my life, and I, I just knew I wasn't in the middle of where God wanted me to be. And it was amazing how, uh, first and foremost, God used my wife to say, Matt, you're supposed to be going into ministry. Why do you keep fighting this? He used my pastor at the time. My pastor was like, Matt, you're supposed to be in ministry. He would get, open up the pulpit for me to preach on a Sunday morning. It's just a lay person in the church saying, I, I just need to show you this is what you're supposed to be doing. He used my business partner. My business partner clearly had ulterior motives for me not to go into ministry and said, Matt, you're supposed to be in ministry. And it was just amazing how God uses other people to call us into our purpose. It's that spurring one another on we just read about in Hebrews 10, 24. We're supposed to encourage one another and call each other. God, the Holy Spirit's going to lay a purpose on our hearts. It's going to show us and then use other people to encourage us to go and do it. And that doesn't happen outside of a corporate worship experience like this. Here's what Romans 6 verse 13 says. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body. You ready for this? Use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. You think about our worship team, they get up here. Some of them play instruments as an act of worship. The Bible says that because of how God has changed your heart, you should use your entire body. You should recognize the goodness of what it was accomplished for you on the cross. And therefore, you should be willing to say, God, I want to use my whole body. I want to put my hands up in the air. I want to clap these bad boys. I want to shout with my mouth. I want to sing with my lips. I am going to be an instrument of praise. And not just during the music. God, I want to use my body in, in, in the learning. God, I want to use my body. I want to open up God's word. I want to take notes. I want, I want my whole body to be in this as an instrument of praise. God, I want to, I want to be willing to give. I want to, be will, I, I, want to, I want to serve. I want to use my body as an instrument of praise. And these are all things that happen when we make a decision and a commitment to worship God corporately. So as we ask God what he wants us to do, right? We ask this question here. If this is your first time here with us this morning, this is a really simple prayer. What now, God? I want you to notice on the back of your notes that you have, there's a, there's a section called what now, God, where you have a couple lines where you can write a commitment down. 
Every Sunday, you can write down a sentence. What did God just put on your heart that you need to do based on the truth of his word that we talked about this morning? Maybe God's putting something on your heart right now. I want you to write that down. God, I, I commit that I, I, I'm going to worship God regularly. God, I commit that I'm going to lead my family. And, and Sunday mornings isn't going to be something that we're making a decision on Saturday night. It's something we're going to do. God, I'm going to make a commitment. Maybe you're here every Sunday, but you, you kind of roll in here like 20 minutes late. Maybe God's put on your heart right now. I want to be a part of the whole experience that God has planned. I'm going to start trying to, to, to prioritize my arrival time. I don't know. Whatever God just put on your heart, write that down. Because if you want to be a mover and a shaker in becoming more like Christ, you're going to recognize the value of corporate worship regularly in your life. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the way you powerfully work in our lives. Thank you for the way you, you want us and call us to be movers and shakers. You call us to become more like Jesus. God, we thank you so much for what Jesus accomplished on the cross, that because of his work on the cross, God, it ought to call us to want our bodies to be instruments of praise, that we ought to want to praise you with everything that we have. We ought to not be ashamed to sing words to you and about you. We ought not be afraid or ashamed to raise our hands in, in thanksgiving for what you've done for us. We ought to, to not uh, be ashamed to, to regularly show up in this place corporately with other believers to tether the Holy Spirit that we have in common and ultimately have this in more powerful connection to seeing how great you are, how desperately we need you, and how you've called us by your grace to come and stand in your forgiveness and in your purpose. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings, Please remember this, you belong at ACC.